And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rachel Stockman, and I will be your host for the rest of the afternoon. We have a new trial that just started up uh, about an hour or so uh, today. The state of Michigan versus Camille Hassel. She is accused of plotting with her lover to murder her husband, U.S. Army Sergeant Tyrone Hassel the third. He was gunned down just outside of his family's home on New Year's Eve 2018. Police say the murder that Kamaya and Jeremy planned the murder to get her husband out of out of the way and collect $400,000 of army pension. We're inside live in that courtroom. Not a whole lot happening. We're going to monitor that very closely because we're not actually able to see. Our feed is not showing us the video they're playing. So in the meantime, while we monitor that live, we're going to take you to the prosecution's openings that we just heard a short time ago. Take a listen. Into some of the prosecution's opening cases in the case against Kamaya Hassel, I want to bring on my panel, Catherine Smith, Norman Williams. So great to be on set with you two. Okay. Okay, let's talk about this case. Uh, the prosecution seems to have a very strong case. They have a confession, but we heard the defense's openings, and Catherine, it seems like they're trying to contend that this was a coerced confession of sorts. That's right. Um, they're showing by, I, I guess they intend to prove that by showing, number one, she first gave statements several times before the confession, stating that she didn't do anything. She was transported around to different precincts, um, and also, there was one other factor that they listed, ah, and that they lied to her, that they lied to her that she had already been sold out by her lover. So I think that's what they're going to try to show. But is that going to be successful, Norman? Because as we know from watching a lot of CSA, CSI and uh, Law and Order, police and investigators can lie. That's right. They're uh, when they're interviewing someone, that doesn't mean uh, the confession is not necessarily good, right? No, that's true. What what? <clears throat> What's confusing me about the confession, the alleged confession, right. <laughs> is that snippets of it were being played by the prosecutor during his opening. And I'm wondering if they already litigated, or in Michigan it's called a Walker hearing, in New York it's called a Huntley hearing, I wonder if they've litigated the issues around, around the alleged confession or not, and if they did not, why is the jury hearing it at all? Because there could be problems. Well, I assume if the jury's hearing it, that the judge, if it became an issue, the judge ruled that it was admissible. But the question is these issues that the defense are raising, is raising, Catherine, do you think it will be enough given what we've heard so far of the confession tape? Because it's pretty direct what she says. I, I don't think it's going to be enough. I think it's enough for the defense to have a cognizable defense. I think that they can argue it and it's not a laughable defense, but I don't think it's going to play. All right. Stand by, you two, if you don't mind. My legal experts will stand by in the meantime. Looks like we're back live in court in this case out of Michigan and officers on the stand. Let's listen in. Right, we're inside that Michigan case. It looks like a canine officer on the stand talking about finding the victim's body, bringing in my legal panel really quickly. Catherine, sh he just <clears throat> seems to be a witness setting up what happened in terms of importance. Correct, uh, setting up how he found the body, that the victim was already deceased, and also how he intended to track the, um, the person who did this. Uh, Norman, it, witnesses like this, it looks like, look, he's already being taken off the stand. You try to keep pretty quick to the point, right? right. You don't want to have them on too long because they can't add a whole lot other than just setting up the scene. Right, exactly. And setting up the scene doesn't necessarily hurt the defendant, which is why you didn't see any lengthy cross examination from the defense. Absolutely. Okay. It looks like we're getting, I'm peering over on the corner of my screen. It looks like we're getting a new witness on the stand, but it could take a couple minutes. So it's a perfect time to get in a quick break. We'll be back on the other side and we'll take you back live inside that Michigan case when we return. All right. We're just listening to some of the opening statements from the defense. Catherine, when you were listening to it, uh, you were kind of thinking it was a bit odd. He was like on a justice mission, yes. but this wasn't a case where it's like, really a justice case, right? Is that what raised eyebrows for yeah. you? Yeah, it didn't, it didn't call for this sense of like, you know, this is genuine outrage, right? right? To watch out for this. This, this isn't some innocent victim that had nothing to do with the case, right? I always tend to balk when I see someone push out with the public policy argument right away because it means that right. the facts are going to lean. Or when they quote Norman the Constitution. He oh, didn't yes. do it in this case. But no. I've seen <laughs> a defense attorneys do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you what effect do you think that has on jurors? Well, quoting the Constitution? Yeah, well, 
well, just being kind of broad stroke about your, your opening as opposed to drilling down on the facts. Well, back to uh, judging what a jury, what you think a jury is thinking, like reading tea leaves, it can, some jurors are going to be offended. Mm -hmm. Some are going to think that you're on the side of righteousness. And it's just hard to tell in an opening before any evidence is presented. You know, it's hard to tell what your words are going to do. That's true. You never know. Every juror, every jury is different. We found that out. Oh, Always yeah. being surprised on what some of these verdicts and what some of the Indeed. questions jurors can ask during the course of deliberations. All right. So we just started this trial, though. So let's listen in to more of the defense his openings because I'll tell you everyone here at Long Crime thought this was a slam dunk for the prosecution. Why would this woman, this officer in the army, even take this to trial? Well, let's listen to what her defense had to say. And you can see the defendant right there, Kamaya Hassel, tearing up, wiping her eyes as she's listening to her defense attorney give his opening statement during this case out of Michigan. It's a very interesting case. And one thing that Norman or Catherine, either of you could answer that I don't quite understand is these people are, seem to be pretty smart. Why would they think, okay, why would they think it was would put them better off, that Kamai would be better off by admitting her involvement in a murder? Because the defense attorney is trying to claim that, that she just wanted to be with him and that that the detective made these false promises that she, he'd sign off with her. Explain the rationale. I don't quite get it. Norman, hard question to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's almost like he's trying to make the argument that this confession was falsely obtained. And was, right. But unfortunately for, for those that are accused, the cops are allowed to lie to you. And if they weren't allowed to lie, there'd be nobody ever caught. <laughs> Exactly. But let's talk about, uh, if we could, we have a couple minutes before we have to go to break. Catherine, let's talk about the actual facts of the case. How, what is her involvement in, she, she did not pull the trigger killing her husband, uh, but apparently she used Snapchat to plot this, or at least that's what prosecutors are alleging? At least that's what she said, right? Because the Snapchats, I, I don't think we have the Snapchats, is my understanding. That they, they disappear. Exactly, right. which is the whole reason that they use Snapchat. And this, taking back to Rachel, to your point, like why she, there would be any motive for her to say this, I think they were stoking the flames of a woman scorned. She was so mad that she thought that her lover sold her out that she just blurted all this stuff out. And she blurted out the Snapchat. Mm. She blurted out the fact that they were planning this in Korea, that they wanted to do it off the base. She gave a lot of information. Gave because she lot. thought her lover was ratting out her. Correct. And that's what the police had told her. But in reality, that had not happened. That's but that's a, a common that's technique. That's a common she tactic. Would think that she would know this. Everybody should know that that's a tactic. Anyone that's watched Law & Order, where oh. they put the two people in a room or and anything. lie to each other. Sorry to always bring it back to Law & Order, but I mean, come on here. Or anybody that has more than one child. I mean, that's how you <laughs> get, that's what you do. Exactly. To all the viewers, never talk to the cops. <laughs> you, because they also can lie. Coming from a defense attorney, I don't think everyone would agree with that. If you're innocent, uh, you definitely don't have anything to hide. There's no problem with talking to police officers. Catherine, it's been a pleasure having you, you here in studio with us. Norman, you're going to stick around. Mm -hmm. We have to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network, but we have a lot going on. Um, we're covering three, yes, three trials across the country, all fascinating trials. One of them is in Verdict Watch, so we're watching out for a verdict in that one. But we'll return in just a few minutes to give you a breakdown of them all. Stay with us.